Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to present on a relatively hot topic in the local bridge world, which is buried corrugated steel plate culverts. Our today's presentation is titled Inspecting to Load Rate In-Service Steel Culverts. My name is Dave Conkle. I currently serve as the local state aid bridge engineer. And today I'm also with Moises Damatalangan, who serves as our state aid bridge load rating engineer. We apologize, we are unable to attend live today, but we thought it would be a nice touch to provide you guys a professional video of our presentation. So before we get started, please notice the two slides on the screen. The picture on the left is a buried steel long span plate culvert in a District 3 county, indicating a severely deflected and flattened crown. The picture on the right is the same buried culvert in a collapsed state. How the culvert eventually collapsed was a result of a variety of reasons, including structural damage during installation and the placement of additional roadway bedding and extra weight over the sagging culvert over time and an extremely heavy, wet and rainy season. This incident along with the fact that our local bridge inventory of steel culverts are reaching their expected design life, has prompted us to include steel culverts in our current and upcoming special hauling vehicle load rating contracts. Believe me, we are learning a lot about steel culverts lately. This presentation will cover the history of steel culverts, the basic geometry, physics and design behind steel culverts, the important and unique inspection requirements, and to briefly touch on the load rating aspects that are evolving across the nation. Here's an overview of Minnesota steel culvert history. Currently, there are approximately 1,200 steel culverts on the local bridge inventory. The most popular culvert type is the steel pipe arch. They were heavily used in the 50s through the mid 70s and have slowly declined ever since. For the steel pipe culverts, they were popular between the late 60s through the early 90s and with a little positive spike in 2012. There are also some steel arches, long span, and aluminum box culverts on the local bridge inventory. Steel pipe culvert service history. The graph represents the distribution of steel pipe culverts based on their age and condition. It shows that the older steel pipe culvert in Minnesota is about 119 years old. The middle of the bell-shaped curve corresponds to the average removal age. It shows that for steel pipe culvert, the average removal age is around 45 years. This statistical analysis suggests that 95% of steel pipe culvert will be removed by age 74 years. Here's the same graph for steel pipe arch culvert it shows that on average, steel pipe arch culvert will only last about 40 years, and 95% of them won't make it past 63 years. For steel arch, the average removal age is about 52 years, and 95% of steel pipe arches will not make it past 78 years. Now here's an abbreviated histogram for the steel long span culverts. Unfortunately, the data set on long span culverts is insufficient to develop a statistical forecast or trend. Now let's get into the basic shapes and dimensions of each culvert type. 
let's start with a round shaped pipe culvert or steel pipe culvert. Steel pipe culverts have the same radius. They are typically used under medium to high fill areas. According to our steel pipe suppliers, the maximum span is 26 feet and the largest in Minnesota is 16 feet in Lake County. The next shape is a steel pipe arch culvert. Steel pipe arch culverts have two distinct dimensions, the rise and the span. They are typically used in areas with lower headroom. According to the table, these guys have a maximum span of 20 feet 7 inches with a maximum rise of 13 feet 2 inches. Looks like Hennepin County tried to push the limit on this one with 23 feet. We'll definitely have to keep an eye on that one. The more interesting shape is the steel long span culvert, which is elliptical in shape. Long span culverts have flatter crowns and floor geometry. They can go up to 40 feet in span length only if you provide them with longitudinal stiffeners at the top. Otherwise, without the stiffeners, they can only go up to 15 feet in span length. The maximum rise is 29 feet 7 inches. Currently, Kitson County holds the largest long span culvert in the state with a span length of 37 feet. And finally, the steel arch culvert. Steel arch culverts are bottomless culvert. They are typically supported on concrete foundations. They are usually used in areas with large waterway openings and lower clearances. They can go up to 26 feet in span length with a maximum rise of 16 feet 7 inches. The maximum recorded span that we have is 25 feet in St. Louis, Carver, and Washington County. Now let's talk a little bit about the profile of what you would typically see out in the field for the corrugated metal pipe. Corrugated steel sections, also known as plates, have a standard profile of 6 inch by 2 inch section. That means it's got a 6 inch pitch and a 2 inch profile depth. Plates come in sections which are bolted together in the field to form the required shape. They were first used in Minnesota in 1931 and for the wall thickness, they range from 1/8 to 3/8 inch. The profile and mellow thickness are important information in the load rating calculations. Compressive and buckling strength demands are directly determined by these measurements. Here's a typical bolt pattern and sizes for both the longitudinal and circumferential seam connections. The bolts are typically three quarter inch in diameter placed in two rows that are staggered, one in the crest and one in the valley. For the longitudinal seam, they are installed along the length of the barrel. For the circumferential seam, they are installed around the barrel to connect the pieces together. The photo on the right shows bolted connections for an arch pipe. As an inspector, this is a critical location to look for cracks or crimping along the bolt line. Now that we've fleshed out the basic details encountered in steel corrugated metal culverts, let's briefly discuss their structural mechanics, which allows them to support large fill depths and traffic loads. The steel corrugated pipe and the soils are both vital elements to the structural performance of the culvert. Hence, these structures are considered composite structures made up of steel corrugated pipe, or barrel as we call it, and the surrounding soil. With inadequate backfill material around the pipe, as we apply vertical load to the pipe, it attempts to deflect. See the red dashed line. In the case of a round pipe, the vertical diameter decreases and the horizontal diameter increases. But when the embankment fill is well compacted around the pipe, 
the increase in the horizontal diameter is resisted by the lateral soil pressure. The picture on the right shows two pipe arch culverts with very low fill heights. With the low fill heights, the composite behavior between the soil and steel corrugated pipe may be insufficient to carry legal traffic loads. Now let's take a look at what happens with the forces around the pipe. Looking at the diagram, as the soil provides good lateral support resistance, the pipe sets up a uniform radial pressure around the pipe wall that we call compressive force C. And in our load rating spreadsheet, we call that T or thrust. This compressive thrust load is equal to the vertical pressure times the span length divided by two. If the pipe can handle this compressive force to resist the soil pressure acting on it, then the system is considered stable. So how do we calculate the soil pressure? Soil pressure is equal to the soil density times the soil depth. As shown in the diagram, to achieve a composite behavior, the culvert must have at least one foot of soil cover or the span length divided by eight, whichever is the greater of the two. Also, good backfill is important. You need non-plastic sand and gravel that are well compacted. Studies have shown that when soil is well compacted around and over the culvert, the soil loads to the pipe will go down and the stiffness demand for the pipe will also go down. Here's a slide showing the design truck we call HL93, both in plan view and elevation. There are several dimensions shown in these diagrams that are accounted for in the load rating analysis. Unlike bridges, culvert have short spans and only a portion of the truck can inflict load transfer to the culvert at a time. The diagram on the right shows you how the spread of the axle loads from the design truck are being transferred over the culvert as a function of height. According to AASHTO LRFT design specs, the effect of live load and impact can be neglected when the depth of fill is more than eight feet or exceeds the span length. Basically, as you increase your soil cover, the live load spreads out further until it dissipates. Let's take a look at what happens to the dead load and live load stresses on the culvert based on the height of your soil cover. The vertical axis shows the height of the soil cover and the horizontal axis represents the load acting on the culvert in pounds per square foot. As you can see, as you increase the cover, the truck load and impact effects go down, but the earth load effects go up but when you combine the two, there's a sweet spot. It's where your system is most efficient, where the live load and dead load effects are about the same, and that's at five feet of soil cover. If you go below five feet of cover, your dead load goes down and your live load starts to take over and produces more stress on the culvert. But if you go over five feet of cover, your live load goes down and your soil weight takes over and that adds more weight and produces more stress on the culvert. So basically, five feet is the magical number. If you can achieve that, you're gonna have the most efficient culvert system. Here's a quick overview of the basic structural design work needed for steel corrugated culverts. The designer needs to understand the forces exerted on the various culvert types and shapes. It's important to make sure that the material thickness and the corrugations are designed properly to limit the compressive stresses and to provide a safety factor against buckling. Also, longitudinal seam connections must be strong enough to resist the compressive forces and the seam strength must be greater than the pipe wall strength. 
One thing to point out on this slide is the diagram below of an arch pipe. If you look at the corners, even though the pipe is a closed system, those corners behave like footings. Basically, most of the dead loads and live loads are transmitted to those corners. And you end up with high stresses in those areas more than any other location around the culvert. As a result, cracks and crimping tend to develop in those areas along the bolt line. If you don't have good support at the corners, you end up with settlements in those areas and the culvert will drop down. A good indication if a culvert is experiencing this kind of behavior is you end up with depression, dip, or cracks in the pavement above. Okay, let's discuss and for some refresh your knowledge on steel culvert safety inspections. The Bridge Inspection Field Manual does an excellent job covering the inspection procedures and structural element condition ratings for steel culverts. Also, if you look back at your 2014 safety inspection training materials, Pete Wilson covered the steel culvert inspection topic in great detail. Today, we will emphasize and dial in on the common structural deficiencies that affect steel culvert load ratings. Just remember, typically the single most important feature to inspect and measure when inspecting steel corrugated culverts is the cross-sectional shape. We'll cover the various shape inspection techniques today. The right-hand photo is an example of bituminous pavement condition over a poorly performing culvert. You can see the settlement and bituminous pavement cracks. On the other hand, the left-hand photo shows a section of new repaired bituminous pavement over a steel corrugated culvert. Unfortunately, the steel corrugated culvert below this new pavement section was in poor to severe condition. Any poorly performing pavement, dips in the roadway or the guardrail and or side slope settlement over a steel corrugated culvert generally means the stability of the soil around the culvert has been compromised. This can be caused from leaky longitudinal or circumferential barrel joints, barrel settlements, leaky and corroding steel plates, and etc. Another item that an inspector should look at is the longitudinal deflection along the barrel. Here is a settling pipe arch culvert. When you look down the culvert barrel, the bolted seams can provide a visual guide for spotting settlement or sag. If you walk through the culvert and notice that the water is deeper near the center line of the roadway, that is another good clue. This culvert had about a one foot settlement near the center. This sagging culvert can lead to erosion at the upstream end and piping around the outside of the culvert. This creates soil support issues for the culvert, resulting in further sagging, deformation, and structural issues. Okay, this diagram depicts longitudinal deflection or settlement in flexible steel culverts. The portion of the steel culvert that has a higher embankment fill, as you see under the roadway, is really expected to settle more than the culvert ends. So for your information, some steel culverts are constructed with a camber, as you can see in the above diagram, much like a steel beam. So you do wanna look for evidence of uneven settlement or negative camber as we call it, along the length of the culvert barrel. Okay, another item you would like to look for or should look for is joint separation and leakage at the longitudinal or circumferential seams. Longitudinal and circumferential joints serve to keep the pipe section in alignment and to keep the backfill soil from infiltrating into the pipe or water conveyance from exfiltrating out of the pipe. 
So it's very important to thoroughly inspect these locations. The photo on the left shows a longitudinal seam in the invert that has completely failed and cusped. This creates a gap that allows backfill to be lost and disturbed, which reduces the compressive strength of the seam. When a cusp seam is significant, the culvert shape will likely differ significantly. The right photo shows a failed circumferential joint. These failures are a little more rare, but they may indicate a foundation or an embankment failure. As we continue along with the structural inspection assessment, we'll be looking at bolt hole tears and longitudinal seams, rusting, pitting, and perforating. In the left photo, the seam should also be checked for cracking at the bolt line and for loose or missing bolts, tip bolts, and shifting steel plates. These are additional signs that the backfill is unstable. The steel plates and connections are likely overstressed. And also it's another point for backfill infiltration. The right photo shows severe corrosion at the water line, which is typical in many culverts. Corrosion and abrasion is the most common cause for culvert replacement. Eventually the steel material degrades, leaving perforations or even holes in the steel plates, which again allows backfill infiltration and reduces the structural strength of the plate. We may have mentioned this before, but one of the most important items to inspect and look for and even measure is barrel distortion. Here's a few photos explaining unsymmetrical and symmetrical deflection or what we call it culvert distortion. Culvert distortion indicates evidence of backfill instability. The photo on the left shows an unsymmetrical distortion because one side has settled and deflected more than the other side. The photo on the right has distortion slightly more balanced and what we would call symmetrical relative to the pipe crown. Symmetrical and unsymmetrical conditions can alter the culvert's load carrying capacity. We'll discuss this later in the presentation. This is an example of crimping of the pipe wall at the spring line. These photos show localized failures or pipe crimping near the longitudinal seam connection. And it's a result of severe crown and invert distortion. This particular culvert was eventually closed according to the load rating calculations. And then we come to lifting of the invert and we've all seen this before. Occasionally when we look down the barrel, we see the bulging of the invert floor. And this is another sign that the culvert has been compromised from a structural standpoint. Here's a few photos showing severe invert distortion and corrosion. These pipes will obviously load rate very poorly in fact, the culvert in the right photo would be closed or should be closed. You can see that complete collapse is imminent. Okay, this is a great slide to demonstrate shape monitoring. As we stated before, shape monitoring is everything for steel culvert load rating. Visual examination with the naked eye is a good start but other more precise techniques should be employed to capture the true culvert shape in the field. The left picture shows an, an inspection photo looking down the pipe barrel. It doesn't readily appear significantly distorted. However, the photo on the right is the actual surveyed shape dimensions. The yellow line indicates the design shape, 
or the shape near the culvert inlet slash outlet where soil load and truck load effects is negligible. The red line shows the actual deflected shape inside the barrel and under the soil loads. The distorted shape represents a peanut with a 16.5 inch deformation on top and a 16.5 inch uplift deformation on the bottom. This discovery called for the culvert to be closed. What you're seeing on the slide is the culvert barrel distortion condition state ranking and definitions table that's in draft form. We will work with Pete Wilson and collect more information from our bridge consultants performing the load ratings to finalize this table for the BACIPM. Note, according to research and monitoring by other states engaged in load rating steel culverts and results from our current SHV load rating contract, produced some of these draft recommendations. According to the table, a culvert is in severe condition when the distortion is greater than 10% of the as-built dimensions. This would reflect distortion in extreme flattening and unsymmetrical deflections in the crown and the sides. Before we jump into the steel culvert load rating spreadsheet, let's go over the key items that need to be measured in the field. These measurements are key input data for the load rating spreadsheet. You want to measure the fill depth at the high end and low end of the road at the crown and also at the shoulder. The reason we do this, we want one location to give us the maximum stress from the earth or dead load and we want one location to give us the maximum stress from the live load. Accurately measuring and assessing the steel plate condition directly factors into the load rating calculations. The steel thickness and condition is used to determine the culvert's thrust capacity and buckling strength. The pitch and depth of the steel corrugations is typically measured using digital calipers. Section loss areas will require an ultrasonic thickness meter. An ultrasonic thickness meter uses sound waves, temperature, and time to determine remaining material thickness. The picture on the left shows heavy corrosion that should be measured using an ultrasonic thickness meter. And the remaining thickness is important in the load rating calculations. When the steel is in critical condition, as shown in the right photo, there is an area reduction applied in the load rating calculations. Depending on the steel thickness or gauge, this reduction can be 80% or more. Additional photos showing terrible corrosion and section loss. The photo on the left shows complete separation at the water line. And then the photo on the right, the consultant used a pick and a hammer to determine if corrosion is present below the water surface. Seam strength is investigated in the load rating calculations based on good, fair, poor, and severe condition state. The first photo shows plate cracking at the bolt holes in a culvert wall. The seam strength is reduced based on the crack length and crack locations adjacent to the bolt holes. The second photo shows a seam in a culvert floor which has broken apart. The stress level at this seam is not as critical as the wall and roof seams. The load rating engineer uses this information to reduce the seam strength capacity. The biggest and most important item we measure and include in the load rating calculations is the culvert shape. Shape monitoring over time is vitally important as it indicates if soil instability is present. If the shape, plate thickness, 
and or the seam conditions change over time, a new load rating should be calculated. In our current SHV load rating contract, we have six different consultants performing culvert load ratings. A few are performing hand and field survey measurements to determine the shape and cover dimensions. We have a few using LiDAR technology, which uses radar principles and pulse laser light to measure distance and to make a 3D model. One consultant is using drone technology and one is using a laser distance measuring device to measure the culvert shape. As the culvert flattens out, it has less thrust and buckling capacity, and the load rating calculations need to account for this effect. The diagram above shows a round pipe symmetrically deflected at the crown. You can see the culvert span has increased in the deflected shape as shown in the red dashed line. If the barrel distortion is symmetrical and the deflection ratio is less than or equal to 5%, the buckling strength capacity is reduced based on the deflection ratio. An important factor in the load rating calculations is the deflection ratio. Deflection ratio is equal to the vertical deflection of, or delta divided by the culvert plan diameter or H sub C. As this deflection ratio value increases, the buckling strength and the load rating decreases. Note, if the deflection ratio is higher than 10%, the culvert may need to be closed, repaired, or replaced. So here's some guidance on a culvert that has an unsymmetrical deflection. If the culvert flattens out unsymmetrically, additional loss in the buckling strength needs to be accounted for. The procedure to analyze culverts with unsymmetrical deflections starts by determining the top radius of the flattened culvert portion. If the engineer or inspector is using hand measurements, they can use the ruler of length P. They establish a P distance as shown and measure the mid-ordinate dimension M. These dimensions are plugged into the R sub T geometric formula. This value is then entered into the spreadsheet to determine the strength of the flattened section for a culvert with unsymmetrical deflection. Now let's take a look at the different measuring techniques that are being used in the current SHV load rating contract. Here's a consultant performing the measurements by hand and field survey. This approach was selected with the intention that the bridge owner could duplicate the measurements in the future. The cost to field measure using this technique and to load rate a steel arch pipe culvert is around $2,500. Here's a consultant performing the measurements with a laser scan device. If the water depth is shallow in the culvert, this device can pick up dimensions below water. In deeper waters, it requires probing and hand measurements. The laser scan data is then organized in a table and plotted to develop the shape profiles. The approximate cost to field measure and load rate a steel pipe arch culvert using a laser device is $2,500. This consultant decided to take advantage of drone and photogrammetry technology. This technology allows the engineer or inspector to capture the required dimensions inside and outside the culvert. However, it doesn't pick up dimensions below the water surface Therefore, it also requires probing and hand measurements when water is present in the culvert. The cost to field measure using this technology and load rate a metal culvert is approximately $3,500. Several consultants decided to take advantage of LiDAR technology. This technology allows the engineer or inspector to develop a 3D model 
and to achieve an accurate shape profile along the culvert. The cost to field measure and load rate a steel arch pipe using this technique is approximately $3,500. No matter what technology was used to measure the culvert shape and cover, these dimensions should be monitored over time. The inspector should reference the culvert load rating reports to determine the critical or controlling locations in the culvert barrel that requires closer monitoring in the future. These specific locations can be marked inside the culvert for future reference. Let's dive into the new steel culvert load rating procedures. We have about 10 more very interesting slides covering the load rating spreadsheet tool. So why the big change to how we load rate culverts? As you have seen, the inspection procedures are nothing completely new, other than a heightened focus on shape monitoring. But our old methods of load rating steel culverts hinge primarily on using pure engineering judgment, especially if the culvert was in poorer condition. Other states with very large inventories of steel culverts recognize the need to better understand the load carrying capacities of steel culverts based on their structural condition and shape. The FHWA also recognized this dilemma in the load rating world and has supported and endorsed load rating culverts using engineering design principles with field inspection and measurements. So as I said, we'll look at the load rating spreadsheet and we'll talk about the origins of this spreadsheet coming from Ohio DOT and the Michigan DOT. The spreadsheet we now use to load rate steel and aluminum pipe culverts was originated from the Ohio DOT. Their spreadsheet was verified by field load testing and research on 39 culverts with a wide variety of age, span lengths, backfill heights, and geometry. Partners in this research effort included the FHWA, the load rating procedures and formula in the Ohio DOT spreadsheet incorporates industry involvement from the National Corrugated Steel Pipe Association, and it incorporates the AASHTO manual for bridge evaluation. As you can see in our contract six currently going on, we are load rating 300 metal culverts. The scope is the inspection, the field shape readings, and then obviously we load rate. And this is what we call a new MnDOT load resistance factor rating spreadsheet. And we also provided guidance documents and those can be seen at the following website address. Also, to finalize this slide under our SHV contract, we employed the good Dr. Steve Olson of ONE to carefully modify the Ohio DOT spreadsheet to include MnDOT's inventory of legal and overweight permit trucks. Steve also updated the spreadsheet to the latest AASHTO manual for bridge evaluation. And then with five other consultants load rating steel culverts and using this new spreadsheet for MnDOT, we have gained a lot of helpful feedback to keep the spreadsheet honest, reliable, and accurate. There's a learning curve on its use and some limitations that Moises is carefully reviewing before the official signed load rating forms are uploaded into our data management system. So let's talk about the basic load rating formula. So quickly, what is the basic load rating formula? It's simply the rating factor equals the bridge structural capacity subtract off the dead load effects. And this is all divided by the effects from live load and impact. We won't go into depth here on the listed variables shown in the lower formulae, but the T sub cap is defined as the thrust capacity minus 
the T sub E, which is the thrust effects from Earth. And this is all divided, of course, by the thrust from the live load impact effects. If the rating factor is greater than one, you are golden. Because our family of legal and overweight permit trucks all induce different live load effects, they all have their own unique rating factor. They all need to have a rating factor greater than one to be able to legally pass across the culvert. So let's dip into our metal culvert load rating example. On the top, you can see the owner is the city of Centerville and it's for culvert bridge 007. Um, the section of question is between 50 and 70 feet from the East Inlet. It was built 1962, corrugated steel plate round culvert. It's computed by Bill Perfect. And obviously on load ratings, we want that to be checked. In this particular case, Mark Fix It is checking. Um, you can see by the photo on the left, the culvert has heavy corrosion in the invert. And it appears the corrosion is typical along the barrel. And just to let you folks know, really to fully explain the spreadsheet and its ability to load rate spiral rib steel and aluminum pipes with and without unsymmetrical deflections and the long span pipes we discussed would really take us a full day. But if you do have more questions about the spreadsheet, please do not hesitate to call Moises and I for a deeper understanding. And we also have lots of consultants working with this spreadsheet that have a great knowledge base regarding its input and output results. Just letting you know, this is a fictitious corrugated steel round pipe example. And you do have additional printouts in your manual today because we have revised it since the training materials were originally printed back in January. So raise your hands if you do not have those additional um, examples for your training manual. So the next thing the bill has to do is he has to enter the culvert plan dimensions and the applicable field measurements. He has indicated the pipe is annular corrugated metal with bolted seam connections. And you can see those in the top two rows. Bill has determined the pipe has a 5% symmetrical crown deflection. And he's indicated that on the third row. The maximum depth of fill is four feet for the maximum dead load effects. And the minimum soil is 3.75 feet to give you your maximum live load and impact effects. So those are the two conditions as we talked about previously that he needs to look at. Again, the span for this pipe culvert is 20 feet and the rise above the haunch or the spring lines is half of that and denoted as 10 feet. The metal type is steel, it's not aluminum. The corrugations are the typical six by two that Moises discussed earlier with a gauge number of 12. So it's very thin material in this particular example. And a gauge of 12 is around 1 8 inch in thickness. Then Bill has to move on and he has to assign the appropriate reduction factors for corrosion shown in the top table. Note the tables and the formula above is from the Ohio DOT load rating procedure verification study. These are the factors that are inputted into our spreadsheet. In this particular case, Bill decided the section has heavy rust and deep pitting and he decided a 50% reduction made sense for a steel gauge of 12. And you can see that in the top left-hand table. His reduction factor here is 50%. It would be a 0% reduction if the steel was new. However, Mark Fixit went to the project site later on in his Ford pickup truck and used an ultrasonic thickness meter 
and accurately determined a 40% condition factor was more appropriate. Mark and Bill both agreed that 40% remaining thickness was the value to use. After this, <clears throat> Bill needs to determine the seam reduction factor, and that is on the lower left hand table there, again from the load rating procedure verification study. <clears throat> if the seams are pristine, Bill would select 100% or one could be used, but Bill noted some cracking at the bolt holes along one seam. He waffled a bit and decided to go with 80% here. Mark looked it over, being the more experienced engineer, and carefully and <clears throat> agreed with Bill that 80% was just fine. On the right top side, it gets a little more messy from a formulae standpoint, <clears throat> but these are buckling factor formulas, and they are auto-calculated in the spreadsheet when we have symmetrical deflection or deflection at the crown. <clears throat> but they do require manual input if the crown deflection is greater than 5% or there's unsymmetrical deflection and the <clears throat> local buckling formula must be used. Another thing the spreadsheet has throughout is lookup tables for the load rating engineer. And here is a sample uh, lookup table um, and it shows you that you can uh, determine from the table what the structural plate pipe seam strength is based on a four bolt situation and three quarter inch diameter bolts on the right hand side and also um, some of the other connection situations with rivets. And this is all based on your gauge of your steel um, shown in the yellow column uh, denoted by steel gauge <clears throat> from 16 down to 1. So then Bill needs to proceed and put in more structure information data. He's got to put in his crown deflection that he determined was at 5% by measurement. The reduction for buckling, because it's symmetrical, would stay at one in this case. The lookup table, he determined the reduction for seam was at 80%, and then based on corrosion, him and Mark worked together and said that should be at 40%. The lookup tables, he puts in the pipe cross-section properties in this case for a 12 gauge pipe, and the pipe seam strength, he noted that the pipes had the six by two corrugations with the three quarter inch bolts, and that's at 43 kips per foot. And then some backfill information, the density and whatnot. And then on the bottom is a bunch of factors from the AASHTO manual, some engineering things that he will put into the spreadsheet. So Bill hits the return button on his spreadsheet. And this is a look at some of the output, which is uh, needed for your load rating calculation. The top box shows the calculations or the uh, output for the capacity, thrust capacity of the round pipe here. It looks at the wall yield strength. It also looks at the wall buckling strength. And then of course the seam strength and it takes the minimum value of the three different situations. In this case, it shouldn't surprise us that the wall yield strength, because we have a lot of corrosion in the invert, is controlling for our thrust capacity. The box down below that, it calculates the thrust effects from earth, and you can see there it's 4.8 kips per foot, and that's auto-calculated in the spreadsheet. The bottom box is basically telling you it will now compute the thrust capacity for the live load and impact effects. So here's a slide calculating the thrust effects from live load plus impact. You can see the formula at the top. A little reminder, the rating factor is the capacity minus the thrust effects from earth. That gives you the reserve and all divided by the thrust from live load and impact. 
So this one is calculating that and it is showing some of the values for your HL93, your single truck and your semi truck and trailer. So here's a table showing you some of the output for the rating factors for the various trucks. On the top right hand corner you got the rating factor again. We'll just review that. It's the capacity of your pipe. Subtract off the effects from earth, thrust effects, and then that's all divided by the thrust from live load plus impact. So you can see in the lower right hand box as you click that it's giving your rating factor for your design truck and your single unit in this case as an example and then it goes through all the SHV trucks and your legal trucks and we use these values to determine our posting requirements we have found out that our emergency vehicle trucks normally control the load rating because they are heavy heavy trucks with heavy axles Okay, here are the final load rating summary tables our engineers use to complete the load rating forms. These rating factors determine the possible need to load post or close a culvert bridge. The rating summary tables are being compared. One with Bill at his 50% remaining section estimation and one with Mark's more detailed 40% remaining section determination. In Mark's table, our standard C overweight permit truck should be restricted. You can see the rating value is less than one. The point of this exercise is the spreadsheet relies on good inspection and field measurements. It also requires an, an experienced bridge engineer to understand the formulas, the coefficients, the factors that play into the final results. You really need a sound understanding of state and federal design specifications for flexible culverts. Having this competency allows the load rating engineer to make sound engineering judgment decisions along the way. We feel this spreadsheet is another good tool to get us closer to modeling and predicting steel culvert load carrying capabilities based on its shape and physical condition. Our local statewide effort to load rate steel culverts under the SHV contracts has recently resulted in several critical findings. A few closed bridges as well, and a much better understanding of how to load rate steel culverts. Finally, the key to providing a safe steel culvert crossing in the future is to monitor the shape over time. As the shape changes, we know it alters its capacity to carry load. Please keep working with us on culvert inspection and load ratings. Let's wrap up the presentation and overview some of our changes with our load rating forms. Form 90, that form is going to be phased out for aluminum and steel corrugated metal arches and pipes and other systems, buried systems. Can no longer use that form for load rating. That was an assigned load rating form. That one, if you, your NBI condition was four or less, it would revert you back to the physical inspection rating form. We are now requiring our engineers to use the RC slash CL form, which we use for bridge structures. And with our load rating spreadsheet, we do have calculations now, so that form should be used and the load rating engineer would attach the spreadsheet to the back of it for the documentation of his load rating results. Then finally, the physical inspection rating form. We still want our engineers to use that. Um, if the maximum and minimum soil cover is exceeded beyond the limits of the spreadsheet, for example, very deep fills with live load effects um, are very negligible in that situation or zero, or in the case where you have very shallow fills where the soil structure interaction is not necessarily fully present or active, and is not accurately being modeled in the spreadsheet, we also want them to go ahead and use this PIR form. Finally, just three references for you folks, um, if you wanna dig in deeper on this. The BCIPM B.3.10 inspection procedures 
For culverts is an excellent uh, document to look at. Um, it really goes into good detail on your inspection um, requirements here for steel and aluminum uh, buried systems. And then you got your National Corrugated Steel Pipe Association design manual. They got a 2018 version that's excellent. And uh, the Federal Highway uh, FHWA Culvert Inspection Manual 1986. That baby is in black and white, um, but it has a lot of great information in it. So thank you for your attention from Dave Conco and Moises Stamakalangan. There is our email and our phone numbers. Feel free to call us anytime. We're here for you and uh, we just appreciate it. Have a great day. Bye now.